two, one, zero. Okay, hey guys, so I'm on my own here down at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Right over here is the Vehicle Assembly Building, and then tomorrow night, that is where the Falcon Heavy is going to be taking off. And I think somewhere over there is where the boosters are landing. We're heading over to a press event over here right now, but I'm so excited to be here. Good afternoon. I'm Laura Aguiar with NASA Kennedy's Office of Communication. Welcome to our pre-launch Space Technology Show. SpaceX and the Department of Defense are getting ready to launch a Falcon Heavy from Historic Launch Complex 39A. NASA is going along for the ride. There are about two dozen satellites on board that Falcon Heavy, all part of the U.S. Air Force Space and Missile Systems Managed Space Test Program 2 or STP-2. Hi, I'm Dr. Todd Healy, and I'm the Principal Investigator and Project Manager for the Deep Space Atomic Clock. And I'm Dr. Jill Soybert. I am the Deputy Principal Investigator. We've been working on this project for over seven years, and we're really excited to be here today to tell you all about it. The Deep Space Atomic Clock will be the first ever ion-based space atomic clock to fly, and it will also revolutionize the way in which we will navigate through deep space. We expect this to be a key part of sending humans to, to Mars and be um, a key component to future GPS-like navigation systems at the Moon and Mars and other planets. How do we navigate through space? Currently, spacecraft flying beyond Earth don't have a GPS to find their way through space. Navigators on Earth send a signal to the spacecraft, which receives it and sends it back. Extremely precise clocks on the ground, called atomic clocks, measure how long it takes the signal to make this two-way journey. The amount of time tells them how far away the spacecraft is, and how fast it's going. The farther out in space the spacecraft is, the longer it takes to receive and send the signal. But what if humans are sent to another planet, like Mars? A two-way system that sends a signal from Earth to a spacecraft, back to Earth, and then to the spacecraft again, would take an average of 40 minutes. Imagine if the GPS on your phone took 40 minutes to calculate your position. You might miss your turn, or be several exits down the highway before it caught up with you. If humans traveled to the Red Planet, it would be better if the system was one way, allowing the explorers to immediately determine their current position, rather than waiting for that information to come back from Earth. NASA is testing new technology that would allow future explorers to do just that. The Deep Space Atomic Clock is the first demonstration of an atomic clock that can be used for navigation in deep space. It will allow a spacecraft to calculate its own trajectory instead of depending on Earth. If a spacecraft had one of these clocks on board, it could receive a signal from one of those big antennas on Earth and quickly measure its speed and position. The Deep Space Atomic Clock could one day let astronauts navigate safely and accurately to Mars and beyond. <clears throat> this technology demonstration is the first step one-way space navigation a reality. These spacecraft are really far away. I can't pull out a ruler and measure the distance from me to the spacecraft, right? But I can measure how long it takes for the spacecraft to echo back a radio signal that we sent from the Earth. And the longer it takes for me to hear that echo back here, the further away my spacecraft was. So to navigate safely, we measure that echo, that signal return time, very, very accurately, down to better than one billionth of a second. But in order to measure it that accurately, we need to use those atomic clocks in the deep space network here on the Earth that were, as you saw in the video, quite large. They're about the size of a refrigerator. Now, because of this limitation, we can't really put that on a spacecraft and send it into deep space easily. Uh, because of this, every single spacecraft that's out there exploring deep space is being navigated by people back here on the Earth, people like myself and Todd. But the Deep Space Atomic Clock is actually here to change that because we have taken the performance of those refrigerators and we've shrunk it down to something that's about the size of a toaster oven here. 
So you may not realize it, but most everybody here today used an atomic clock. And that's because atomic clocks are part of every GPS satellite in orbit. And we use those GPS satellites in our GPS-enabled apps, maps, Google Maps, Apple Maps, so forth, to get here. Um, and then uh, you may then ask, so if GPS atomic clocks can work for that, why can't we use those for deep space navigation? It's because deep space atomic clock is about 50 times more stable than those GPS clocks flying today. It is exquisitely precise. In fact, the deep space atomic clock, we expect to lose or gain less than three tenths of a nanosecond over the course of a day. And that translates into something like a second over 10 million years. And then you may ask, well, why do we need that level of precision? It's because light travels fast, very fast. So if you can imagine a light signal or a radio signal which travels at the speed of light is um, traveling from Earth to the moon, it takes a little over a second. So we really need to get our timing right. If you can imagine sending that same signal from Earth to Mars to figure out the distance of that spacecraft, if we miss that timing by, the, by a second, we've effectively missed hitting Mars by the same distance the moon is from the Earth. Hi, I'm uh, Chris McLean. I work with Apollo Aerospace. I am the uh, principal investigator on the Green Propellant and Fusion mission. And I'm Joe Cassidy. I'm the executive director for space at Aerojet Rocketdyne. And we are uh, proud to partner with Paul on this mission. So uh, the Green Propellant and Fusion mission is this spacecraft over here, which I'll talk about a little bit more later. I'm Dr. Nikki Fox, and I have the world's best job because I get to lead uh, NASA's heliophysics division at NASA headquarters. And the more and more we start to rely on technology every day, the more we become susceptible to these big space weather events. Space weather has many different kind of flavors, so today I'm going to focus on one area in particular, which is the Van Allen radiation belts. Of course, the first discovery of the space age, when we realized space wasn't empty, but it was actually a really, really cool place to go and explore. So if we can run the video, you can see just how dynamic these Van Allen radiation belts are. There are two of them, an inner belt, mostly protons, um, but actually very dynamic. We didn't realize until we had the Van Allen probe mission that has been up there for six and a half years, really telling us all about the dynamics. And you can just see this huge amount of particles that are going all over the place. The radiation belts themselves can pump up and get very big. They can get very, very um, dense radiation, very, very high energy particles. And because the radiation belts are kind of continually moving, it's almost like they're breathing in and out, there are spacecraft that often are not meant to be in the radiation belts that suddenly find themselves engulfed by the radiation. And so those components that are on those spacecraft can be extremely susceptible to these space weather events. As you can see from this poor little spacecraft, who's going to be quite upset in a minute, as it gets hit with radiation, and then unfortunately, lots of nasty things happen to those components, and the poor little thing falls over. And it's very sad little spacecraft. If only it had had an atomic clock, it might have been able to run itself, but it didn't. So, so the, poor, the poor spacecraft is crippled. And what we are doing with the, this uh, experiment, we are kind of stowing away on another spacecraft, uh, the Air Force Demonstration Space um, Experiment, DSX. And we are a little stowaway payload. And we have four technology um, experiments on there. They're looking at, one of them is looking particularly at cosmic rays. So all the nasty guys that come from outside our solar system, um, kind of where Voyager is right now, and coming in and impacting us here. Uh, we have one that is looking at, at what is the right dosimeter, so what a me a something that's going to measure the total dose, how much radiation we're seeing, which is the best one. Let's fly a whole bunch of different ones that you fly every day in space technology and look at which one survives the best. This is real science. That's a CubeSat. Yeah. So CubeSats are 10 by 10 by 10 cubes, a uh, centimeter, 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter centimeter. And this is a 3U CubeSat. So there's three of those blocks stacked together. So that people talk about CubeSats, that's kind of what they're talking about. That's the sort of size scale. All right, so we're again right by the VAB. I just got out of the press conference back there. We're heading over to the countdown clock and again right behind there that's where it's going to be taking off. 
this actually, I don't think this is where we're gonna watch the launch uh, for this one, uh, but this is actually where I watched the launch, what was it, like nine years ago for uh, the second to last Atlantis launch. We were able to watch it right from in this field, but I think they're having us go into a different place this time. So not only is SpaceX here, but over there is Blue Origin, which is Amazon's company to do launches. There she is. This is the Atlantis. It's been up in space, I don't even know how many times, but this is the actual ship. This is not a replica. I'm just leaving the Kennedy Space Center for the end of day one, and I gotta say, it was <laughs> Pretty awesome first day, and really, we didn't even get to any of the really, really cool stuff just yet. Um, but yeah, day one, uh, we started off uh, doing the check-in, and then went over to the NASA press site, and it was actually really interesting there. Um, they had, like, so, okay, obviously, the main event is the rocket ship going up, but what's really happening is it's sending up a whole bunch of science experiments and uh, there was some of the actual uh, like heads of the you know the, the various experiments uh, we actually came and talked to us today so it was actually really really interesting uh, learning more about why the rocket's actually going up not just that it's going up so that was actually really really interesting it was uh, awesome to see that i uh, then went over to the kennedy space center i've been there uh, several times now but uh, just because i've been there before doesn't mean it wasn't still awesome uh, there was a couple of exhibits that i had never actually seen before that i got to see uh, so i really did enjoy that um, and then, uh, so I actually was hanging out with a couple other people from the NASA Social, um, and when they all left, I actually went in Tesla, uh, there's a Tesla charging station uh, at the Kennedy Space Center. It was occupied when I first got there, so I wasn't able to charge. But I went back and was able to charge there, and as that was happening, I went in and did a couple other things. So, yeah, um, it was just a really great day. I uh, headed back to the hotel for the night. I might try to find some place to eat, but yeah, tomorrow's going to be a really long day, uh, starting at I think like 9.30 in the morning is when we're starting the meetup, and uh, then I'm not entirely sure what we're going to do just yet, but I think they're taking us inside some uh, buildings that you don't normally get to see publicly, so that's going to be really awesome, and then obviously the, the big event is at 11.30 at night when the ship Talking if it goes up in the air. So, um, yeah, it's gonna be a long day, but really excited. And day one already was definitely worth the trip.